Sally Mahihu has been an advocate. Ah, just hold it, just hold it a little. Listen to this. Minister Sally Mahihu is a high achiever. She has been an advocate of the High Court of Kenya for over 35 years since December 1985. Having graduated with a bachelor's of law degree from Bristol University and thereafter with a master's in law from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Now, she is the prophet, the proprietor of the law, sorry, she is the proprietor of the law firm of Bowa Mahihu and Company Advocates. And she is a commissioner for oath, a notary public, an arbitrator and mediator, and a certified professional coach. Now, Minister Sally sits on several corporate boards and is a trustee in several and various foundations. She's also the founder of the Seasoned Woman, a forum for the empowerment of women in the marketplace through mentorship and training programs. Now, Minister Sally has recently authored seven books which will be here on sale today outside the facility center at a very special discount and offer of only 500 shillings a book. These books usually retail for 1500 apiece. Now, these are the books that you will get, The Seasoned Servanthood, Distress to Destiny, You Are Naming and Defining, your calling and positioning, your relationships and networks, your shaping and your making, your harvest and legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's be upstanding as we receive the gift of God this morning, Minister Sally Mahiko. You're welcome. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Pauline, for that generous introduction. I honor you and respect you, Pastor Pauline. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, church. God, uh, I am just privileged and honored to be here today. And I'd like you to join me in thanking, acknowledging, celebrating my destiny midwife. Reverend Teresia Wairimo. Mom, it is almost now 28 years. I've sat under your feet. I have developed a healthy, healthy revelation of who you are in my life. I honor you and I respect you. And I thank you so much for nurturing me and just being there. Thank you so much, Mom. I want to thank God for the guest speakers, Prophet David, uh, Pastor Philip and Pastor Rebecca, Pastor Hans and Pastor Rihanna, Bishop Alan and Pastor Kathy, and Prophet David and Pastor, uh, Pastor George, and every single one of you. Your Excellency, I celebrate and honor you. Your Excellency, Mrs. Rachel Ruto, we love and honor you. And everybody else, I want to thank God for every one of you, every single one of you in this congregation today and the online viewers. And I want to also thank God for my husband, Mr. Gary. He is a support. When God was dishing out husbands, he favored me. He favored me. And I thank God for you, Mr. Gary. So straight to the word this morning, you may have your seats, and I'm going to go very quickly and share what I believe the Lord has put in my heart this morning for us, and uh, I'm going to make some opening remarks uh, before I go into my message, and one of the things I want us to agree on is that each and every one of us, children of God, there is a promise, there is a plan. And there is a purpose that God has ordained for you and I to bring forth. Amen? We can be agreed on that. And that purpose, plan, and promise does not drop from heaven onto your lap. It must be conceived, carried to full term, and birthed. Are we together so far? We must be in a place where we conceive 
that which God has promised us, his plans and purposes for us, we must carry it, become pregnant with that thing, and then we must carry it full term and then bring it to a place of travailing and laboring to bring it forth and to birth it. Now, I don't know about you. Perhaps it is a ministry that God has spoken over your life. Perhaps it is um, a, a whole mega business that he has spoken and said, you will birth a business that will have such impact. Perhaps it's a leadership position that God has said he will bring you into a place of leadership, impact, and influence, and expand your sphere of influence. Perhaps it is affluence and wealth. God has said he will cause you, enable you to bring forth such wealth, you'll be an end-time financier of the gospel, and you will be very wealthy, and he has given you the purpose for that wealth. Maybe it's a calling, a gifting, a talent. It could even be innovative concepts and creations, create creative, innovative things. Maybe he has spoken to you about your children, that the way you see them today, a time is coming when I'll make them whole. I don't know what God has promised you or what he has planned for you and I. You know that which you must conceive birth and bring forth. Now, in this sanctuary today, there are three categories of people, and I want you to be able to discern and work out which category you belong to. Number one, they are those who are seeking and waiting to conceive, to conceive that which you know God has planned for you. Either he has spoken to you, it's in your word, or he has given you a prophetic word. Then there's another category of those who are already pregnant. They're already pregnant and they're already carrying that thing that God has promised you. And then there's a third category who have conceived, they've been pregnant to full term, and they are currently laboring and travailing and birthing that thing. One of those categories you might be in. Whichever category or season, because these are seasons in your life, that you are in, you will need a destiny midwife. A set, God, a set man of God, like Mordecai was to Esther, Naomi was to Ruth, Elijah was to Elisha, and Paul was to Timothy. You will need a destiny midwife, a set man of God. So the title of my message today Understanding the power and the authority of your destiny midwife. Understanding the power and the authority of your destiny midwife. Now, understanding the role of your destiny midwife in every season, the role of that destiny midwife, that set man of God, in each season, not only one season, in each season in your life, is critical to entering destiny. Remember that your midwife, your destiny midwife, is also ushering others. If you've ever been to a maternity ward or a hospital birthing room, the midwife may be in charge of five, three, four, five other women who are birthing, other people who are birthing and laboring. So she's running from this room to this room. So understand emphasis. And once we understand emphasis, that your destiny midwife may lay emphasis on certain of the proteges, certain of the children, the seed that he or she is ushering to destiny, depending on the season, it will help you and I not to become needy. Allow your destiny midwife to usher your spiritual siblings. Are we together? Sometimes we get lost there. We get lost there. We must learn to know that you will not be neglected you will not be left out. Your destiny midwife knows what they're doing. A destiny midwife is a God-ordained divine covenant relationship. It is not a buddy friendship. It is not a high-five friendship. And there's a difference. The sooner we get that revelation, the right revelation of who your destiny set man of God is to you, their role, many of us 
will stop being offended. Yesterday we had a very powerful message about Ahithophel. Once we understand about, have a right revelation of our destiny midwife, that it is not a friendship, we will not get offended when he or she doesn't come for tea. When he or she doesn't visit you for a casual visit. Their role is a divine covenant relationship for purposes of ushering you to destiny. It is not a buddy high five friendship that you can put down any time. It's lifelong. The other thing we need to understand is about the eye, the eyes of your destiny midwife. Your destiny midwife has the eyes of an eagle. They see what you do not see. They see where you're going far beyond what you can see about yourself. The hand of your destiny midwife is a hand of power and authority. The hand of your destiny midwife is a hand of power and authority. When we talk of the hand of God being upon you, there is enablement, there is a gracing, there is an ability to accomplish and to do exploits. So when the hand of your destiny midwife is one of power and authority, the heart of your, spirit, of your destiny midwife is a heart of commitment. By the time your destiny of commitment, like Moses was arguing with God about the people he was actually to destiny, Naomi told Ruth, I will ensure, I will ensure that I hook you up. That is the heart of your destiny midwife, your set man of God. The eyes, they see what you cannot see. They see where you're going. They have the hand of power and authority to literally handle every situation in your life by the grace and the power of God and the heart of commitment. Now, the role, as we have said, of your destiny, midwife and set man, is to help you conceive, carry, and birth everything that God has in store for you. Your destiny, midwife and set man, takes great risks to ensure that that which you are conceiving, carrying, and birthing is not killed by the enemy. You remember the two midwives, uh, Pua and Shipra? when they disobeyed the demonic order of the king in order to protect the birth of people like Moses, your destiny midwife is so committed that they will take great risks to protect your destiny and my destiny. Amen? Now, during your journey to destiny, your destiny, the, 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 your destiny midwife, the role, it will entail instructions and directions, not suggestions. Let's get this right. During that journey to destiny, it will entail a series of instructions and directions. Each and every time, there is an instruction here, a direction here, a guidance here. And those are not suggestions. They don't have to make sense. Bishop Alan told us that yesterday. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not. She is not suggesting. He is not suggesting. It is an instruction and a direction because your set man of God is God's mouthpiece in your life. So they are speaking from hearing God. They are working in you from hearing God. They follow God, and that's why we follow them as they follow Christ. So we must be very careful to have no opinion in the presence of greatness. When we're given an instruction or a direction, let us be careful not to offer an opinion because it wasn't a suggestion, it was a direction. And the sooner we get that revelation, the sooner we will accelerate our journey to destiny. I'm making opening remarks. Now, your destiny midwife, set man of God, you are the pursuer. You are the one to pursue that relationship and ensure you cling to that relationship. Ruth and Oprah in the book of Ruth. One chose to kiss her destiny midwife goodbye. Kiss her destiny goodbye. Ruth, however, chose to cling to her destiny. Be a destiny clinger, not a destiny kisser. That is in Ruth 1, chapter 14. Now, Elisha refused 
to go away. Elijah kept telling him, go away, stay here. Let me go, I'll come back. But he was persistent in pursuing his Elijah. You must be persistent. You must remain connected no matter what. Stay there. Seasons come and seasons go. Remain no matter what happens. Remain. Continue to pursue your destiny midwife and your set man of God. Cling to them in and out of season, irrespective. Now, I said there are three categories of people in this room. And for each one of us, irrespective of the season we're in, whether we are trying to conceive, whether we're pregnant, or whether we're laboring to bring forth, we must understand certain things about the season you're in. You must understand the nature of the season. You're able to discern and understand what kind of season am I in? How does it look like? And I'm going to go into that. The purpose of that season. You must also understand how to position yourself in that season. Also, where are you at? Which place or space are you at in that season? Also, who are the people you're going to encounter in that season? And how should you relate to them in order not to abort that season? What are the pitfalls and dangers that you're going to find in that season? And how do you overcome them? And also, what lessons are you to come out with from that, less, from that season? It's very crucial. So let's go to the first season, the season of conceiving. And this is the season when your destiny midwife will teach you how to break your barrenness. Your destiny midwife, set man of God, will teach you how to break your barrenness. Now, the nature of this season is characterized by a dryness. Now, listen very carefully, because each one of us will discern which season we're in. It is a dry season, unproductive, unfruitful, lesslessness. You're going around the same mountain again and again and again. You're stuck. You're not moving. There's a desperation and a frustration. There's a deep yearning that many around you may not understand, but you know there's a deep yearning because you feel there's something that's supposed to happen in your life, but it doesn't appear to be happening. So there's that yearning. There are cycles. You find yourself going around in cycles, financial distress cycles, children parenting crisis cycles. You go through uh, your business cycles where nothing is shifting or moving in the direction you think it should be going into. Now, the purpose of this season is, number one, to understand how to position yourself correctly so as to conceive and become impregnated with the seed of greatness and the purpose and plan God has for you. It is also for removing any hindrances that may hinder the conception of that which you're supposed to conceive. Now, in a natural situation where you're birthing a natural baby, the midwife, the medical midwife, does what we call fertility counseling, checking to see anything that may hinder. They want to ensure you have a healthy womb. They will check and they may find fibroids. Fibroids are growths that stubbornly embed themselves on your womb, in your uterus. And this symbolizes strongholds in your life. Mindsets, wrong mindset, wrong thought patterns, toxic emotions, things that are strongly held, strongholds that are hindering you, past pain, woundedness, unforgiveness, bitterness, offense. Yesterday we heard about offense. Strongholds, things that are holding on to you so strongly that they're hindering the conception. What fibroids and growths do, they hinder conception because they take up the space that your baby is supposed to take. That's what fibroids and growths do. So in this season, they must be removed. They must be removed. And that's the first thing you'll be advised. I believe many here can testify. They had fibroids or cysts or growths removed before they could then safely conceive. And those mindsets, whatever it is that is holding us back, hindering us from conceiving, we must allow our destiny midwife to point it out and to remove it through the power of prayer and declaration, discipleship, teaching, 
Whatever we need to go through to have those mindsets, toxic emotions removed, those fibroids, so we can conceive. And the other thing about this season, I remember one of the things Pastor Reinhard Bonke used to say was when look and see and focus on the gold in people, not the garbage. Because in each one of us, there's a gold and there's a garbage. See, as ministers, we need to look at the gold, focus on the gold. So in this season of breaking barrenness, as your destiny midwife shines and polishes the gold in you, remember your destiny midwife sees what is in you, the potential, the gold. As they polish and shine it, the garbage is eliminated. You don't even have to focus so much on the garbage. As they shine the gold, polish it, bring it forth, bring out your potential, bring out your strengths and your giftings, weaknesses, failings will be eliminated in the process, in this season. The things that hinder you from conceiving will be eliminated. David saw mighty men in a distressed debtors. When they came to him, he saw mightiness, he saw greatness, and he took them on. He saw the gold in the distressed debtors. And in due season, as he walked with them, they birthed that mightiness in them, the mighty men of David. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. Peter before the Pentecost. There is, there's a time we are Peters before the Pentecost. Zeal without knowledge, jumping all over the place. And our destiny midwife and set man of God will not reject us or cast us away because they know there's a Peter that is the rock. A Peter after the Pentecost, powerful, powerful, fulfilling his purpose. So it is very important that we understand that God in his faithfulness will ensure he puts you in the hands of a destiny midwife who is so passionate to bring out what God has for you, to bring out the potential in you and to see that you birth what you're supposed to birth, become who you are created to be and do what you are born to do. Amen? Very crucial. Now, the other thing about this season is your positioning. How are you positioned in this season when you're trying to conceive and break your barrenness? You are separated from the crowd, the noise, too many voices, too many opinions. You are separated. If you find yourself being separated, in fact, it's a, it's a, it's a choice. It's a choice to separate yourself so that you can do what? Become intimate with God. Get into a place of intimacy. Physical, natural conceiving is never in public. See, it's behind closed doors. Secret place. So likewise, when you're conceiving your destiny, it is a private, it is a hidden, it is a private thing in separation, intimacy with God. When you're naked, open, surrendered, receptive, not resistant, you will not receive the seed we will not birth the seed or conceive it if we're resisting it. There has to be a surrenderedness in the presence of God, a nakedness to allow God to do what he needs to do in us, separated away. And these are seasons you find yourself in when we're separated so that we can intimately come into a position where God can impregnate us with the seed, the purpose, and the plan he has for us. It is a divine encounter and a divine visitation. In fact, most of the people uh, who conceived in the Bible, there was always a divine encounter or a visitation, somehow to show that God, you had encountered God in some way or other, and the impregnation had come upon you. Now, the place where you're at during this season of trying to conceive is, number one, Shiloh. You are at Shiloh, like Anna, a place of worship, a place of travailing, a place of seeking God. Hannah went to Shiloh to press into God. Shiloh is a place of worship. It's a place of travailing, a place of pressing for your miracle. So that's one of the places you're at. In Samuel 1, 6 to 16, you also could be in a dark pit like Joseph, abandoned by your brothers, by those you trust. A place of abandonment where you are cast away, in the dark pit you will conceive. 
Because in a dark pit, you will draw closer to God because man has rejected you and abandoned you at that time. Seasons of conception. Genesis 39, 19 to 23. That's where Joseph was in the pit abandoned. There's also the cave of Adullam. After the prophet Samuel had spoken the word over David, he lay, because when the prophetic word comes, the promise doesn't manifest the same night or the same day. So David found himself conceiving in the cave of Adullam when he was separated. I remember he told his mother and father, go away, stay away. Let me see what God has for me. There are times you need to be separated and alone in the cave of Adullam so that God does what he needs to do for you. Then you can go for your people. Because at the time before the cave of Adullam, you may be of no use to them. You may not be dealt with by God sufficiently to enable you to bring out your people from the wilderness. So it's very important. Then for Jacob, his conceiving came at Jabok. At Jabok, a place of wrestling. A place where he was so desperate to conceive a new identity, to change his old ways and inherit and lay hold of his destiny. So at Jabok, when you find yourself at Jabok, wrestling, wrestling with God, because you know there's something he's supposed to impregnate you with. There's something that is supposed to break forth. That's what happened to Jacob. And for Ruth, it was on the threshing floor. The threshing floor is a place of sifting, a place of separating the good in you, the, the necessary and the unnecessary, the wheat from the chaff, that which is useful, that which is not useful. On the threshing floor is when every excess baggage in your life, every toxic, anything that is not necessary for destiny is separated and sifted out so that you remain with what is necessary for destiny. For Jesus, it was the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22 where he travailed because he was birthing, he was conceiving our salvation. He was conceiving our salvation. So it is that in Luke 22 where Jesus was travailing so that he could conceive that which he would bring forth on the cross, which was our salvation and our redemption. Now in this season of conceiving or trying to conceive, the people you will encounter are people like Elkanah. Eokana does not have a revelation about your destiny. Let him be. He does not have a revelation about your destiny. He is a necessary relationship. Yesterday, I think somebody said there are those you choose, you choose, you choose your friends, but you can't choose your family members. Eokana is a necessary relationship, but he does not have a, a revelation of your destiny. He doesn't understand your yearning. He doesn't understand what is this you're looking for. Why you don't want the Volvo? You don't want the Shinde? You don't want the big house? He's not understanding. Why can't I just give you all the jewelry you need and you keep, stop crying. Stop going to your prayer room. Stop praying in the toilet. Stop this crying, praying every day that God has to, you know, what is this? He wants to give you what he thinks can satisfy you. The Elkanah endorsement is what I call it is dangerous do not allow people to endorse you out there and tell you that you are there you have arrived you're okay the, I always tell mom they are friends of mine who think I'm their Benihin yani, I'm, I'm the most I'm the most knowledgeable in the word of God among them but I have to be very careful not to allow them to endorse me like your kana and be satisfied and settle for less than what God has for me. Only my destiny midwife can endorse me. Only my destiny midwife, my set man of God, can endorse me. Be careful. Beware of the Elkanah endorsement. You don't have to fight Elkanah. You don't have to exchange words. You don't have to explain. You have no idea what my destiny is. <laughs> Let Elkanah be. Proceed to yearn and travail and seek for God to impregnate you. Do not allow it. In this season, the other character you'll meet is Penina. I call it the Penina provocation. Contrary to what we may think, Penina is not your enemy. She thinks she's your enemy, but you and I know she ends up provoking you to press for your miracle. 
The penina provocation is crucial. The mockery, the taunting. You're sitting there and say, Ui, kama aliabot, papa siyake. This day she looks like she has aborted. You know, she looks like, Ui. there is the mocky, the taunting. You will go through all that when you haven't conceived, when you're barren. When you're trying to break your barrenness, there'll be all sorts of judgment, criticism, condemnation, taunting. Now, Hannah was wise. She did not waste her energy or focus on Penina because Penina was not the breaker of her barrenness. She knew she, Penina was not. So she allowed the Penina provocation to push her into Shiloh, into pressing to God. And that's how she broke forth and conceived her miracle. There's a story of the eagle and the crow. What happens, the crow, a very irritating bird, it climbs on the neck of an eagle and it starts pecking the eagle on the neck. Can you imagine how irritating that is? Pecking, 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 pecking on the back of the eagle. The eagle doesn't flutter and waste energy to shake it off or to fight it off. The eagle flies high. The eagle soars, soars higher and higher. Higher in prayer, higher in your capacity for the word, higher in spiritual maturity. The ego soars high, and the higher the ego soars, the thinner the air gets. The crow cannot handle the thin air, and the crow falls off the back of the ego. So like an ego, when the crows come on your neck to peck, to mock you, to taunt you, Fly higher. Go higher in prayer. Go higher in the word. Go higher in obedience. Go higher in servanthood. Just go deeper in God and let every crow fall off your back because they cannot handle the level. They cannot handle your level and your greatness. They cannot. Amen. Now, in this same season, you will encounter another character. Uh, no, no. The, the main character you encounter here is Eli the priest. Now, it is interesting that it is only when Hannah's desperation reached breaking point. Remember, we're told she had been to Shiloh every year. Every year, they'd go to Shiloh. Every year, to do sacrifice, take sacrifices. But this particular year, Eli, the priest, the set man of God, noticed, spoke, and broke her barrenness. So it is only when your desperation... You know, sometimes we think we want to birth, but we're not sure. We want to conceive, but we pray here and there. You come out of the... You're not clear, but your set man of God knows which son and daughter is desperate enough. They can discern in the spirit and say, the lady in orange in a red dress, come here. You're birthing a business. You're birthing international, relay, inter international connections. They know. They have the God ability to discern. Eli, in that particular year, Finally so, that Hannah's desperation had reached breaking point, and she was ready, and that's when he spoke the word and broke her barrenness. So, so, so let, let's know by the time your set man of God speaks the word, they have discerned, they have looked. When you're not ready, you're not ready. When we're not ready, we're not ready. Now remember that Samuel, what Hannah was carrying, became significant, the move of God in Israel at the time. So even with the mockery, the taunting, the delay in your conceiving, what you bring forth will be so significant, will have such an impact globally, that those who have been mocking you like Penina, do you ever hear of Penina's children? We don't know what they became. We never hear of them. They were insignificant. But Samuel is the one who became a global, global nation shaker. A move of God in Israel at the time. So it's very important. Do not get discouraged. Do not give up. Remain in Shiloh. Consistency. Continue. Now the pitfalls and dangers of this season is a closed womb. Remember, it is a season of breaking your barrenness. So if the womb continues to stay closed, there is obviously something that's not working out. For Mikhail the daughter of Saul and the wife of David, she was so resentful and offended at David when David was dancing for the Lord that in her resentment, we are told that she will remain barren for the rest of her life. Beware of a closed womb. 
because of touching the anointed of God, because of developing a resentment, developing an offense. Bishop Allen spoke to us about offense that can make you not bring forth. Mikhail, in 2 Samuel 6, 23, remained barren because she developed resentment and offense at the set man of God. There's also ignorance. One of the dangers in this season is ignorance. Not knowing why you need to conceive. Rachel and Leah were not conceiving anything of God at the, at the beginning. They were competing. It was a competition, a carnal, fleshly competition. Who will be better than the other? Sometimes we want to conceive that mega business or that leadership position or that wealth for the wrong reasons. And that can hinder your conception. It is important we understand the purpose for which we want to conceive. What is this wealth for? What is this leadership position for? What is this influence for? What is it for? It's for the purposes of God, for the expansion of the kingdom of God, for blessing the people of God. There's always a God agenda in that which you're carrying and that which you're bringing forth. Rachel and Leah missed it initially. And that's why the, 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 it was a kind of competition and, and hence the barrenness until they came to a revelation of why they needed to conceive. Until they came to that revelation in Genesis 30. Now, the other danger of this season is conceiving an Ishmael. Because you become impatient. God has a timing. God knows when you need to conceive. So when we become impatient, we conceive an Ishmael. And remember that Ishmael will always mock your Isaac. Your Ishmael will always mock your Isaac and threaten your Isaac. So it is crucial that we trust the timing of God, we trust our midwives, we trust our set man of God, that ultimately we will conceive and we will bring forth at the timing of God, the lessons from this season. From Hannah's example, I find that giving sacrificially is one of the lessons we must come out of in this season. Because Hannah went to Shiloh, a place of sacrifice, where they took sacrifices. Giving sacrificially appears to break your barrenness. Because as Hannah continued consistently going to Shiloh every year, ultimately her barrenness was broken. When we give sacrificially, consistently, without getting tired, you reach a point to say, ah, I'm not going to tithe this year. God must first repay. Let him first repay what I've tithed last year. Let me first see what he's going to do with what I've tithed last year. When we're not consistent and not sacrificial, we'll remain barren. Hannah's barrenness was broken because she consistently went to Shiloh, the place where she offered sacrifices. Are we together there? Very important. Another lesson, that sowing into your set man of God breaks your barrenness. You remember Ruth? When Ruth and, and Naomi went to Bethlehem, she began to glean in the field of Boaz. And as she did, we're told that she used to carry the grain and go and bless Naomi, her midwife. And it is that comment that Boaz made that I have heard of how kind you are to your Naomi, to your midwife. And ultimately, Naomi then said, I will set up, I will speak to my kinsman redeemer. When you sow into your set man of God, your barrenness will be broken. Because it is then that Naomi spoke to Ruth and gave her instructions, go and do this, this, and this. And there she conceived, and her barrenness was broken. She conceived her boas, her miracle, her purpose, her plan, the one God had for her. Now sometimes, the Shumanite woman, mom spoke of the Shumanite woman, now, she made room for the servant of God. She wasn't even doing it with any ulterior motive or agenda. She just wanted to bless the man of God and make room for him. And she did. And in the process of doing so, her barrenness was broken. You remember? So making room for the servants of God, creating a conducive atmosphere for them to preach the gospel and fulfill their assignments and visions, being available for the servant of God to fulfill the building of Ezra, positioning yourself in a way that you make it easier. You are a destiny helper as the midwife fulfills the plans, the, the visions God has given her. 
you are breaking your barrenness without even knowing. Barrenness of your business, barrenness of your finances, barrenness in your marriage, in your relationships, in your influence, in every area of your life. You're breaking, your, bar your barrenness has been broken. Now sometimes, I think, it may not be the time like we said, number one, Hannah needed to reach desperation point, breaking point. So sometimes we're not ready, we're not desperate enough. But there's another time when that which God has planned for you to conceive, carry, and birth, the church, the society, and the nation are not ready for it. Can we agree on that? There are times you may want a leadership position, and that society or community is not ready for that which you're bringing to that sphere. And they'll end up killing you and not recognizing your gift. Sometimes the gift you're carrying, let me put it this way, because I want us to get this. Sometimes what God wants you to bring forth, the people are not ready for it. The society, the government, the nation, the, the ch they're not ready for it. So it, you have to be patient, because God knows the right time for you to bring forth that gift when it will be received. Because sometimes you may want to rush to conceive that which the people are not yet ready to receive and embrace, and in the process it will be killed. Amen? So it's important. And as we have said, your destiny, midwife, is used of God to break your barrenness. Now the other ones who are in the pregnant, pregnant, uh, pregnant season, those who are in the season when you're pregnant, you know you're carrying something, and you're, you're either in the first trimester, second, or third, but you're carrying something that you have conceived. Understand the nature. Now, in this season, you're uncomfortable. In physical pregnancy, you're stretching, you're throwing up, you're, 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 you're expanding. It's a season when you're uncomfortable. You're expanding. Now, symbolically, you're growing in the things of God. You're expanding. Your capacity, your maturity, your knowledge of the word, your revelation level is expanding because it is a season where you're carrying something. You're carrying the purposes of God, the promise, the plan. So you have to expand. You have to grow maturely. You have to grow in spiritual maturity in order to have the capacity to carry with that which God has put in you. Because sometimes the greatness you're carrying can be too much for you. And you might find you're not expanding simultaneously with that which is growing within you. And in that case, then what you're carrying can kill you, I believe, if you're not careful. So I think we must allow the expansion, the stretching, the spiritual growth in that season where the character is molded. In the cave of Adullam, David's character was developing. His character was developing. He had been raw. The character was being shaped and molded. In the pit, Joseph, his pride was dying. Remember when you were saying, me, I'm going to be on top of all of you. I'm going to be your leader. I'm going to be the moon or is it the sun? I'm going to be, he was showing off. He was young and immature. But in the pit, the pride started to die. In the place of abandonment, when you're conceiving, when you're pregnant, the pride would die because you're growing, you're growing spiritually. So you're becoming more, more mature. And Ruth, even on the threshing floor, the garments of mourning, she had been a widow, she had just lost her husband. The mourning garments, the stench of death was peeled away. As her, as her midwife told her, wash, anoint yourself, change your garment, change your mindset. You're not a victim anymore. You're not a victim anymore. Cast aside the widow image. You're now about to become a bride. So we need to remember that there are things changing. When we get pregnant, there are things that are falling off and there's character being built. There's mindsets that are being developed, proper mindsets. And there's, Hannah's desperation was quenched at Shiloh because when you become pregnant, that desperation is quenched. Jacob's stubbornness, his conmanship, was tamed at Jabok. All that dysfunction in Jacob, in the wrestling, as he got pregnant, it was tamed. So pregnancy is a season when you're growing maturely, spiritual maturity. You're, physically, you're stretching. Now, the purpose of that season is to incubate that which you have conceived, nurture and feed it with the word of God, with prayer, with right relationships, right destiny relationships. 
proper prayer uh, uh, partners, you know, you're in a season where you're feeding what you're, what you're carrying. In the physical, you feed it with the right things, vitamins, the right food, right everything. So spiritually, you're feeding what you're carrying, your purpose, your plan, the plan of God, by being positioned correctly, by, by feeding with the word of God, etc., so that you grow the capacity, you grow your capacity, and the capacity of that which you're growing. It's a gestation period. The positioning, now, when you're pregnant, this is the season when you're not all over the place. When you're not active, active all over the place, uh, mixing with all sorts of people. It's a season of rest almost. It's a season of, 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 uh, a season of soberness, a season of quietness and stillness. And this is the season when you watch what you wear. Now, I know these days they wear these tight. I wonder how the baby is breathing, but in our days, <laughs> You let it go. You are loose. You, you didn't want to suffocate. We thought we were suffocating the baby. So you watch what you wear. Now, this symbolizes that you need to be careful about yokes and bondages. Do not be bound with yokes and bondages because they can suffocate your baby. So no tight garments which symbolize yokes and bondages. Design them. Break them. Come out of them. Set yourself free. Let your midwife set you free. Go for prayer. No high heels. Now, when you're pregnant in the physical, you can't trip, Cindy. You can just, you can't, you have to wear a reasonably low shoe. Because if you trip, you can harm the baby. Symbolizing, we're not saying if we wear six inch heels, we're proud, but symbolizing pride, self exhortation, self aggrandizement. So the minute we conceive, I know it's a nice thing to conceive and you want to show off, but we must resist pride, self-exhortation, self-aggrandizement, be humble and thank God that we have conceived and we're pregnant and not mock other people like Penina. And then the other thing is, when we are pregnant physically, I remember you couldn't lift heavy loads. Because if you lift a heavy load, you can rupture the uterus. You can rupture your, your womb. So uh, when you see a pregnant woman with a heavy, everybody runs to help her carry the, the, the heavy load. So this symbolizes that you need to not lift excess baggage, emotional baggage, offenses, people around you bringing baggage, fights that are not yours. Don't fight battles that are not yours. Don't allow yourself to have heavy loads, emotional woundedness, fast pain. All those are baggage, heavy loads that will rupture your uterus. Be careful or break your back or injure your back. Remain hidden, remain still. We find, as mom told us on Sunday, Elizabeth remained hidden. Let what you're carrying grow before the destiny killers come to, to attack. It grows sufficiently enough so that the destiny killers have no place. Now, the place where you're at during this season is a safe place, the place of assignment. Let us be careful because when we're trying to conceive, we will conceive at your place of assignment. Do not disconnect from your place of assignment. Each one of us knows our place of assignment where we're supposed to conceive purpose, conceive the promises of God. It is the same place of assignment that you carry and be pregnant. So don't conceive at your place of assignment, get pregnant, and then you start going off to another place where they don't know what you have conceived, they don't understand your history. That midwife there doesn't know what vitamins you take. They don't know whether you have edema, whether your feet normally swell. Are we together? Remain in your place of assignment under your destiny midwife who has an assignment from God over your life. They know your history. They know your dysfunctions. There are people who can't handle some of us out there. They can't. They don't know how to shape us and mold us. Our destiny midwife knows how to shape us and our dysfunctions and our failings. You go there, they'll kill you. So remain in your place of assignment. The people you'll encounter in this season other pregnant people, Mary and Elizabeth, there were two people carrying destiny. Hook up with destiny carriers. Hook up with others who are pregnant like you, pregnant with purpose, pregnant with God's purposes and plans. Hook up with such people so that you're not hooking yourself with those who are bitter and angry and resentful and critical and jealous and envious because they haven't conceived. Be careful. Mary and Elizabeth, rejoiced when they came together because they were both carrying purpose and destiny. You will need mentors at that time. 
your helpers, your ladder holders, hook up with the right destiny relationships. Beware of destiny killers, sabotages like Tobias and Sanballat. When Nehemiah was birthing the plan of God, when he was carrying the plan of God, tell him, when you're pregnant with purpose, there'll be destiny killers like Tobias and Sanballat, sabotagers who will come to derail you, to remove your focus from being in a word, being in prayer, being in servanthood. They'll want to derail you to come away so that in the process, what you're carrying is not fed and it becomes weaker and weaker and you may miscarry it. In this season, that is in Nehemiah 6, 1 to 14, the dangers in this season is that those fibroids, and this is true in the physical, when the fibroids are removed at the beginning, the growths in your womb so that you can conceive, they, they are removed before you, uh, before you conceive. If you're not careful, they can grow back. When you become pregnant and you forget they were removed and they symbolize strongholds and mindsets and toxic emotions, we get back into those toxic emotions and wrong mindsets and wrong thought patterns, woundedness and past pain. If you fall into that again when you're pregnant, those strongholds will come back again. And this time, they'll be more dangerous than before. Because this time, there's already a baby in your womb. There's already purpose. There's already a plan of God, a promise of God. And what they do when they grow, they begin to suffocate what you're carrying. They begin to take the nutrients, what is feeding into your baby. They begin to suck the nutrients. And your baby begins to become weaker and weaker. So be careful when you get pregnant to remember. See, those fibroids were removed. They're not growing back again. They're not go I'm not going to go back in toxic emotions. I'm not going to go back into woundedness and past pain. I'm going to stay clear of it. Stay clear of it so that what I'm carrying is not threatened. And it's not threatened to the point of a miscarriage. Now, the other thing is, the other danger is fear of failure. If you have conceived before and for some reason it miscarried in the physical, there's normally a natural fear of conceiving the next time because you're worried that last time I miscarried at three months, what if I miscarry again? That's in the, in the physical. In the spiritual, you may say last time a word was spoken over my life that I'm going to have this, this, I'm going to do this, and it, the, there was an abortion of purpose. I didn't birth it. So I'm fearful to receive that thing again and carry it in case it aborts, I abort it again. But let me encourage us. We have a God of second chances. We are wiser in each season. We are more mature. Just because I aborted that prophetic word last time, God is a God who revisits his word. He revisits his word because his word cannot fall to the ground, cannot be in vain. So be encouraged, do not fear. Do not become discouraged. Oh, I've got a prophet. This word I was given 20 years ago, I think I aborted it now. I, I'm even scared of receiving another word. No. Be expectant. Be courageous and bold and seek to conceive again because for sure you'll bring it forth this time. Let's not allow the enemy to torment us and to scare us and to weigh us down. Now, sometimes in the physical, there is genetic factors in your body that can cause a miscarriage. Not your fault, just genetic factors, chromosomal things, and it's not your fault. In the spiritual, there can be generational cycles and patterns. Remember, in families, there's generational cycles, patterns, satanic patterns, that every time we reach this age, we die of cancer, or somebody we don't marry in our family, divorces, generational patterns. Now, the good news is your destiny midwife, the hand of your destiny midwife, the words of your destiny midwife are powerful. She has, he or she has the authority to break, to break every generational cycle, every pattern, every satanic pattern in your life. Your midwife can break it, nullify and cancel it so that you have a fresh start and you will not miscarry that which you have conceived. Are we together so far? So we can say that your destiny midwife has the power and the authority from God to arrest any miscarriage of what you're carrying. Amen? Now the lessons from that season is that you must carry full term. When babies come before term, they can be very tricky.
to nurse them to become full. So the idea is to carry to the full timing of God. The season, God has said you must carry that thing. So it's not an overnight thing that you uh, conceive today, you birth tomorrow. It is a process. Allow the process of what you're carrying to grow and develop, the gift in you to develop, for God to build your capacity, your spiritual maturity, your revelation level, so that by the time you're birthing what you're carrying, you are strong enough, you're mature spiritually enough, you're strong enough and have the capacity and a good understanding to be able to nurture that which you have birthed and to even bring it forth. So that's one of the lessons we learned during that time. And the other thing is, as what you're carrying grows in that period of incubation, you also have to grow with it. That's what I said earlier, and it's very important. We must expand in spiritual growth and maturity to give space for what is growing with you to also grow. Because if you don't grow, what is in you will be suffocated and, 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 and the threat of, of an abortion of purpose. Now, the final season, I'm going very quickly. The season of those who are laboring and travailing to birth. You've conceived, you've carried to full term, you're now in the season of birthing and tra travailing to birth. Now, the nature of this season is every trial, every test, every challenge reaches crescendo. Yani, you are suffering to the point where you, you're asking yourself, where am I and where am I going? You know, there's a suffering and there are tests and challenges that can be so severe. A fiery furnace where the temperature is so high, you don't think you survive. That's a season of pain. When you're bringing forth, travailing and laboring to birth, there is such excruciating pain that many do not think they will live. Physically, I told my doctor, I think I'll die. It looks like this pain is not human. You don't think the pain is normal. You are scandals, slanders, your headlines. Financial distress where you're being auctioned, where you're being distressed beyond the normal. A place where every relationship in your life collapses and it is severe testing. When your children become everything the devil would want them to become. Everything in your life just turns upside down. And that's when, when you come to praise here, you see somebody praising, doing like this. Birthing is messy. Laboring is messy. It is so messy. There's no dignity. And I know you remember those of you who are in the maternity ward, in the labor ward. That gown has, has no buttons at the back. You remember? You march through that place there and... <sighs> And you don't care. I remember later on a client telling me, oh, Mrs. Mahiu, I, I, my wife was, was delivering and I also came and I saw you there. <laughs> Dignity. An international client. He was a German. An international client. I saw you there. So I didn't want to ask, what did you see? It's a time when you have no dignity. Put your dignity down. Come here and worship. Let the shoe fall. Let the wheel fall. Worship, worship, praise, travail. There's one time my husband and I went to a, uh, to a church near our house where my sister-in-law was, and we're sitting there, and then one lady was travailing, and, and she went under the bench. So my husband said, why is she going under the bench? I said, leave her. You have no idea where she's at, what she's asking God. So it's a time, it's a, you'll recognize that season. Where's you Kasema, you won't recognize it. You will know that season. Because everything that can go wrong goes wrong. This is the time the distress, your distress reaches um, uh, crescendo. The purpose of this season, listen carefully, is to expand your birth canal sufficiently to allow what you're birthing out. Now, your birth canal represents your faith level. Because sometimes we fail to birth because our faith level is not sufficient. The opening up, it is also a dilation. The midwife is checking. How much have you dilated? Have you dilated enough to bring out what you're, to birth out? And when, there's a, when the dilation is not enough, Dilation is opening up. 
I imagine is checking our revelation level. How much revelation do I have of the things of God, of the word of God, of spiritual things? At the birthing place, you must grow to a capacity spiritually that will enable, in faith as well, that will enable the birth canal to open. You to open up in a way that you can bring forth. Are we together there? So it is important we allow that. Now, also, during this season, you ask yourself, where are you at? You're in the labor ward and the birthing room. Now, symbolically, this is your place of assignment. It's a safe place. Remember, no matter how much pain you're going through, no matter what challenges, some of you may have come here this morning and the way you left your issues, if you are given a time to testify, you'd not finish because you know you're at a place where everything is wrong. You are hurting so deeply. There's such a pain. Are we together? But your birthing is in a safe place if you remain in your place of assignment. In the physical, your medical midwife ensures the room is clean. That is sound doctrine. Your midwife ensures the right equipment is there, the right teachings, the right prayer cover, warfare, intercession. Your spiritual midwife ensures your place of assignment is a safe ground for you to bring forth. Your baby will not be defiled. What you're bringing forth will not be contaminated because you're in a safe place, surrounded by the right relationships, by your destiny midwife, the other children of God around you, the pastors and the ministers around us, Pastor Ann, Pastor Sue, you are surrounded by the right relationships so that your baby is not defiled and contaminated. The right atmosphere and environment is crucial. S some people, when it's time to birth, they go to birth elsewhere. And in that place, it may not be safe. Place of cults, wrong teachings, Doctrine of drinking oil or drinking what? Whatever it is, it's not a safe ground. And your baby will be contaminated. What you're bringing forth, that gift, that business, that leadership position, that promise and purpose will be contaminated and defiled if you go to birth in the wrong birthing room. Remain in your birthing room. Remain in your place of assignment. This is where it is safe. It is safe. It is safe. Your destiny midwife has the skills, skills, you know skills. He or she has the skills to handle anything that may come during that, that period of birthing. If you remember, and the other way you're positioned in this place is strictly obeying instructions. This is the time you're told how to breathe, <gasps> breathe like this, don't push now, push now. Breathe like this, don't push now, push now. Obey the instructions and directions of your destiny midwife. When you're about to birth purpose and destiny, it is so sensitive. You must be obedient, submitted, surrendered. No arguments. They're not suggestions, I told you. They are instructions, not suggestions. When to push. The right timing. Because you may push out your baby before timing and crush its head. Symbolically and spiritually, you may want to birth what you're carrying before time and it, is, it dies outside because it was not yet its time. It was not yet ready. Wait for the time. No matter how, in, don't get impatient. Oh, by now I'm supposed to be preaching. By now I'm supposed to be having a mega business. By now I'm supposed to be doing international business. By now I'm supposed to be the governor. Wait for the timing. Wait for the timing of God. Your destiny midwife knows the timing. Trust your destiny midwife. Trust your set man of God. They know when you need to bring forth. Now, when David, and the breathing to me signifies right attitude. A right attitude where you're not getting panicky and anxious, where you know it is pain with a purpose. It's not useless pain. Whatever you're going through, child of God, has a purpose, a good purpose. Pain with pain. Pain with purpose is beautiful. Because at the end, I saw my baby. We all saw our babies. So that pain that was there a few minutes ago, 
That's not what you talk about. You celebrate what you have brought forth. So it's important that we learn the right attitude, endurance, perseverance in the, in the midst of the severest challenges. When David was about to birth the throne of Hebron, when he was about to birth kingship, he found himself at Kiela, a place called Kiela, a place of betrayal, a place where those he had helped. You have taken them out of hospital. You have done for them beyond normal helping and, and, and giving. They are the ones who betray you. David was betrayed by those he had helped and protected. And they betrayed him to Saul. This is in Kiela, a place of betrayal. So at your birthing time, when you're bringing forth, the severest trials will come. If David had allowed that, that betrayal to keep him there, he would not have entered Hebron. He would not have entered. You must let go. You must let go of every betrayal that comes on the eve of your birthing, on the eve of your breakthrough. The most dangerous season is the eve of your breakthrough. The enemy will send all sorts of things. The people of Kiela betrayed David, but he arose and let it go. Then as Ziglach, it wasn't over. He was birthing the throne of Hebron. He was birthing his kingship, that which he had been carrying in the wilderness. He had conceived in the cave of Adullam, and he came to birth it. And now he goes to Ziklag, and he encountered severe loss. And he lost in Asemaya, Basfair. Now give me Basfair because everything I have in the world has gone. So it's a place of severe devastation. He was told, encourage yourself in the Lord. Because if you allow yourself to fall at that point, you will not conceive the Hebron throne. You will not, and it was just a step over. It was just the eve of his breakthrough. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And he stepped into Hebron. And he birthed that which he had been carrying for over 25 years. Amen? So get over the betrayal. Get over the pain. Get over the losses and the challenges and the devastation. In this season, you meet others who are birthing like you. Your destiny midwife is always positioned in every season, positioned to manage your pain, to help you manage pain, to help you manage pain, to help you work with the pain, manage the pain. She doesn't take away the pain. Your destiny midwife does not take away your pain. Helps you manage your pain. There's a difference. Helps you manage your pain. So it's very important that you allow and listen, the breathing, the pushing, so that you manage the pain. I'm finishing now. What are the pitfalls in this season? The pitfall, in that season of, of birthing, there are your intercessors, prayer warriors, destiny, uh, destiny helpers. You have the right people that surround you. Uh, this morning, when I had driven, 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 and had arrived at the gate, my, the lady in my house, who I call my destiny helper, she calls and she says, Mom, kuna jacket hapa inafanana na yoska to meva. I had left this jacket. Yeah. I said, I'll wear the jacket when I reach, so I drive without. She, so I told her, Who Emily? Iko api? Ebu ambia baba ajanayo. My destiny spouse. These are helpers in your time. He came with my jacket because it's a messy time. It's messy. It's a messy time. When you're bringing forth, you're coming to deliver the word. It's a messy time. You're all over the place. So you need destiny helpers. You need destiny helpers, burden bearers. He, Mr. Ngare carried my handbag in here. Because he was saying, do you want your handbag or not? I wasn't sure. He said, let me just carry it anyway. <laughs> Destiny help us during your time of delivering and birthing. Now, the pitfalls in this season, very quickly as I finish, birthing complications in the physical. Any type of birthing, high blood pressure, placenta failure, anything that can happen during a physical birthing will start. It symbolizes spiritual attacks. Spiritual attacks will intensify during this season when you're about to birth. Spiritual attacks, any kind of attack that can come will come. But your spiritual midwife is alert 
has the hand of power and authority, the voice, the declarations and decrees to cover you, to arrest every birthing complication, to arrest every, every attack. When labor is prolonged, sometimes labor is prolonged, and you have travailed, 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 you're not dilating enough. Now, this is very unfortunate. In the spiritual, this symbolizes that before you birth or the time of birthing, there's a lot of activity, a lot of uh, fruitless labor. I politely call it fruitless labor because I'm a victim of it sometimes. Where you're doing so much, but it's not targeted. You could even be praying, but your prayers are not targeted. Beating the air. Whatever you're doing is not bearing fruit. You're travailing, but you're not opening enough to bring forth. Are we together? This symbolizes you're focusing on the wrong things, fighting battles you shouldn't be fighting, defocusing from what you're supposed to be doing, you're supposed to be birthing. So focus on the birthing and positioning. And this kind of labor, prolonged, can bring a birthing complication, and it can threaten what you're birthing and cause it. What happens then is what you're, you go into maternal exhaustion. You've, you've, tra you've done everything. You've travailed, you've tra but it's not, you're not birthing. There are seasons like that. You've done everything you think you should be doing, but you're not birthing what you were promised you birth. And it comes into maternal exhaustion when you can give up. A burnout. Do you remember Moses? He reached a place where he burnt out. Exhaustion. Where you have labored and travailed, but it's not coming forth. And what happens at this time, even the baby especially, gets into fetal distress. The baby gets tired. Sometimes that which you're carrying can get tired. Even it can get tired of being carried and being pushed and being travailed and it's not coming out. And when a baby goes into fetal distress, it suffocates and dies. It's very important. Now, at that time, your midwife will know and discern. This one, it's not coming out. They have to use forceps. You know what forceps are? It's a gadget in the birthing room that pulls out the baby when you become too exhausted to push it out. Because your destiny midwife will know when you're battle fatigue, when you're spiritually tired, and you need help in pulling out what you're birthing with forceps, or a vacuum. They also call it a vacuum. They, uh, you, that's why it's good to be with the right set of man who knows your character, knows this one is a bit weaker than this one. This one, I need to help pull out the baby. We mungini at a push. Like in this one, I need to help pull out what she's birthing. Are we together? Very important. And then the last thing is that um, uh, during this time, your midwife, your destiny midwife, the medical midwife can resuscitate a blue baby. Sometimes your baby may come out suffocating, losing, without enough oxygen. And there's a method the mid medical midwife uses to resuscitate the baby. Likewise, your destiny midwife can see that what you're birthing is losing the, 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 the strength or, the, or, the, uh, or the, what it should be. It's, it's dying as it's coming out, whatever it is you're birthing. And your destiny midwife has the power to resurrect it through declarations, through words, speaking into that thing, speaking into it and decree that business will not die. That business will not die. That, that thing you're birthing will not die. And they can speak into it. And it can, the lessons you learn from this season is that there's pain with a purpose. That you, whatever you're bringing forth, there must be pain and sacrifice. Many want to bring forth and birth without the inconvenience and the pain. But no, there has to be pain and sacrifice. And you must wait for the timing of God. Your midwife cuts the umbilical cord. My last point. Your mid, your, the medical midwife cuts the umbilical cord. To, sometimes the umbilical cord is trying to strangle that which you're birthing. Are we together? So the midwife must untangle anything that is coming to choke. When Esther and Mordecai were about to birth the liberty of the children of God, they were about to, 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 to birth the liberation of the Jewish people. Haman was an umbilical cord trying to come and choke and hang them on the gallows. Your destiny killer will seek to strangle and choke what you're birthing at the last minute. Be careful. Your midwife will untangle it and cut the cord. Now, when they cut the cord, finally, my last point, when, they cut, when the midwife cuts the cord, this is like a paradox because physically they cut the cord 
and immediately put the baby for you to bond. It's like two opposites, yeah? You're cutting and separating the mother from the baby, and then you're giving the, the baby to the mother to bond. This is very interesting, and I really had to ask God for a revelation on this. This is where what you're birthing is not about you. That leadership position is for the benefit of generations. That wealth is to fulfill the purposes of God. That thing you're birthing is not about you. So that you say, oh, now I'll be doing this. by." It's about the purposes and the agenda of God. So there must be a separation at birth so that what you have birthed can exist on its own. It has a life of its own. Even if you neglected it and decided you didn't want to continue with it, God will choose somebody to come and run with it. Are we together? If you birth a church, pastors, and then you decide you're tired, you want to go and do business, God will find somebody to shepherd his people. So there has to be that separation. But at the same time, there's a bonding, a quick bonding of the baby and the mother to remind you to develop a passion, a responsibility, and a stewardship over that which you have birthed. To know that you have a responsibility from God over that which you have birthed. Are we together? Finally, the midwife cleans and wraps your baby. The cleaning symbolizes to remove any excess baggage from you that may have attached itself to the mother, to the baby. Because the baby comes covered with amniotic fluid from you. During my book launch, the week before, or the weeks before, I was dysfunctional. In fact, I told God, if you allow this launch, it's because of your mercies. Because I was so bad. Ugly behavior, frustrated, uh, angry. The publisher, it's not getting finished. By the time we went to the launch, I was, I told God, is it possible that this launch can go on? Considering how spiritually I am right now, I'm not good. You know how you can repent and repent and repent? Your destiny midwife will clean that which you birth by her declarations, by her words. Because the launch went so well, I couldn't believe it. I got the revelation a week later. But your destiny midwife cleaned your baby. Cleaned your baby. So it did not come out dysfunctional. It did come out with my excess baggage and my bad behavior. It came out cleaned by my destiny midwife because God is faithful. God is faithful. Do not disconnect after birthing. You will need your destiny midwife for postnatal care to name to teach you how to nurture what you have birthed. Are we together? Which season are you in? Are you seeking to conceive? Are you pregnant? Or are you laboring to birth? Whichever season, understand the power and the authority of your destiny midwife, your set man of God. And I'm done. Thank you very much.